Last Sorry, I missed a bit of the introduction, but yeah, I just started the recording. Okay, no problem. Well, we can introduce ourselves again briefly. So yeah, I'm Fran and this is Sam and we are both radiology trainees in the Northern Deanery and we're ST1, so we aren't perfect fonts of knowledge by any means, um, but we hopefully will be able to shed some light on chest x-ray interpretation and deliver a session that will be useful for you guys. Um, both from an examination perspective um, as medical students, but also chest x-rays are something that we have to interact with on a daily basis as doctors. So it's really important that we know at least a little bit about what we're doing. So I will share my screen now, unless there's anything else you'd like to add to that. No, I think that's good. Lovely. And um, there we go. Bear with. Just pop that over. Okay, can everyone see our slides? Yes, my phone. Thank you, lovely. Um, so I've said this already, but yeah, I'm Fran um, and Sam is here with me. We're just gonna kind of tag team this roughly 45 minute presentation on chest X-ray interpretation. Um, please, this is not a formal environment. So if anyone has any questions at any point, feel free to interrupt what is being said um, with those questions. If you don't want to speak up, that's okay, um, but you are very much welcome to, um, but there's also the chat function there if that is your preference. Um, what we're gonna cover um, is a little very basic review of the anatomy that we're dealing with on chest X-rays. Um, you could really take a deep dive into that topic and we're not gonna do that today. We're just gonna really cover the basics um, just to refresh all our memories. Um, and then Sam is going to take us through um, some pointers for like a structured interpretation of those chest x-rays, but also assessing quality there. And then we're going to wrap it up just with some pretty common clinical cases. Um, the only way of getting any way half decent with chest x-rays is just by looking at lots of them. So we'll cover a few common pathologies. They are all pathologies on these chest x-rays um, just to help get your eyes in. And again, if you have any questions at any point, please please ask them. It would be really lovely for us as people delivering this session if you would talk to us um, and answer any questions we ask and just pipe up with what you're thinking about the different cases. Um, so yeah, please do feel free to do that. Um, we're doing this because we like to teach um, and because uh, it's hopefully going to be helpful for you guys in prepping for exams for the future. Um, but as I mentioned briefly before, um, preparing yourselves for eventually being functioning doctors um, who have to look at chest x-rays on a daily basis and form judgments um, about what's going on there. What we're not going to do is kind of address COVID chest x-rays. Um, it's not something I believe that's in your curriculum, so we're not going to talk about it. Um, it used to be something that we're seeing very, very commonly. Obviously, it's very much still out there, but it is less common now, I would say, really? than, than we were seeing before. So we're not really going to touch on that. But if you're interested, feel free to email us or have a little Google. There's lots of resources out there to um, show you what a kind of classic COVID chest x-ray looks like. OK, so we'll start with a brief anatomy recap. So hopefully this is a familiar image to you all. Um, we've got, and I'll just try and minimize this in here. So yeah, we've, we're dealing with obviously paired organs, the lungs. So we've got um, a left and a right hemithorax, each with uh, a hopefully inflated lung. Um, and we just need to remember when we're dealing with chest x-rays that left and right are flipped around. So on what is our left side of the screen will be um, the right hemithorax and on the right side of the screen, the left hemithorax. Um, and this is very useful because wherever there's a paired structure in anatomy, we can compare as we go. And that's just very helpful for identifying when there's problems. Um, and it's just a great place to start is comparing and identifying asymmetry when you see it. Starting um, at the beginning, we have the trachea. So if we go back here, we can see this kind of lucency stripe going down the middle of um, overlying the spine kind of, um, and then it branches at this point, um, which is the carina into our right main bronchus and our left main bronchus. 
This is just a little graphic to kind of demonstrate what is going on there with that. Um, this is a midline structure, so it should be in the midline. And if it's not in the midline, um, then that can raise questions. Is it being pushed somewhere or pulled somewhere else? So it's really worth just starting every film by um, at the beginning, checking the trachea, what's it doing, where's it going? An important thing to note with the main bronchuses is that they're not kind of as this diagram suggests, just splitting equally and going down. The right main bronchus actually takes a much sharper or steeper dive down into the right hemithorax than the left main bronchus. And that's important for various reasons. Um, this kind of demonstrates what I'm saying slightly more clearly. So this image might look a little bit confusing, which is understandable, but it's a, an image from a fluoros fluoroscopic study. So someone has swallowed a contrast agent and the purpose of this exam is to look at the esophagus. But what's happened by accident is a bit of that barium has gone into their, um, into their airways. So we're seeing the tracheal rings outlined here. Um, and what we can see really nice and clearly is this straight right main bronchus going down with some contrast pooling in it. Um, and that contrasts to this much less steep angle of the left main bronchus. So looking at this, it could be quite easy to see how a two-year-old who swallowed a button is going to get more, most likely to have that button in the right hemithorax than in the left hemithorax. Okay. There we go. So to briefly recap what's going on with the lobes in the chest, um, we unfortunately don't have symmetry here. So on the right side of the chest, we've got three lobes. Um, conveniently named upper, middle and lower. And then the left side of the chest, we've got just two. So an upper and a lower lobe. Uh, anyone know what, what's, what are the structures that divide the lobes, what they're called? I can start with this one. Can people see my mouse, by the way, when I'm pointing at things? Yeah, you can see the mouse. Okay, nice. Okay. Anyone know what this, um, I'll give you the first clue. They're called fishes, um, but they each have a name. <laughs> Anyone know what these fishes are called if we start with this one? And it's fine if not. Cool. Well, positionally, it's kind of horizontal, isn't it? So this is the horizontal fissure. Um, and it's the only horizontal fissure because, as I say, the left side of the chest only has two lobes, not three. So there's only one horizontal fissure and it's on the right side. And you can quite frequently, um, particularly if there's any fluid um, building up in the pleural spaces, you can quite frequently see that on a chest x-ray. So it's always worth having a little look in kind of the middle part of the right hemithorax to see if there's a little line going across. And that would be your horizontal fissure if you do see it. Um, then there's another lobe, which we'll see, well, another fissure, sorry, which we'll see more clearly um, in the lateral views on the next slide. Um, and that divides our right middle lobe from the right lower lobe. Does anyone have a clue what that might be called? It's, Is it the ob oblique fissure? Yes, you are absolutely right. Um, thank you for packing up. Um, so yeah, we've got the oblique fissure, which divides our right middle lobe from the right to lower lobe. Um, and then, easy question now, what's this one called? It's just been said. The oblique fissure. Yes, we have two oblique fissures. So a little bit easier on that one. Um, and again, on the left side, that's dividing the left upper lobe from the left lower lobe. So I think our next slide shows us that in, in lateral. There we go. So we don't often see lateral chest x-rays in the UK. I'm told it's done very commonly in Australia and other places, um, but it does reveal some useful information. Um, but this just kind of hopefully will make it a bit clearer in your minds what the lobes are doing and how they're divided with these fissures. So again, we've got right upper and right middle lobes in the red and the green. And then this is the horizontal fissure going across. There's only one horizontal fissure that's on the right side and then we have the oblique fissure going obliquely through the lateral chest um, and what this really demonstrates which is useful for us as clinicians trying to understand what's going on in the lungs is that the lobe which is mostly hugging the right hemidiaphragm is this purple lobe here the right lower lobe so whenever we kind of lose the right hemidiaphragm on a chest x-ray that is a clue that we might have pathology which is sitting in that lobe Whereas when we lose the right heart border, 
the lobe that's mostly hugging the right heart border is this green right middle lobe. So we can start to build up a picture in our heads of, of where the problem is in the chest. Um, and if you have a big nasty pneumonia, for example, sitting in the upper lobe, then that's likely to have a flat bottom if it's sitting on this horizontal fissure. Now, often it doesn't work out perfectly in practice, um, but it's good to have an idea in your mind of where the lobes are sitting. And therefore, if you lose certain anat anatomical features like the right heart border or the right hemidiaphragm, um, it just gives you a clue as to what's going on. In the left side of the chest, a little bit simpler, we've just got this single um, horizontal fissure which divides our upper from our lower chest. I'm oh, sorry, oblique fissure, forgive me. Um, <laughs> and again, we've got a similar picture to the right lower lobe. Um, the left lower lobe is hugging this left hemidiaphragm um, and mostly the heart border on the left side is connected by the left upper lobe. So um, pathology in those different places will obscure different anatomical features. So that's all well and good, um, but in reality, it can be very hard to tell where pathology is in the chest. Um, so describing it in terms of lobes, you just kind of set yourself up to fail sometimes because it can be really hard to tell. Um, so what's easier um, and is likely to be better received by seniors probably, or just clearer maybe in the way that we communicate is if we describe things zonally. So as I said before, the lungs are a paired structure. Um, it's really helpful to compare side by side as we go so we can look for asymmetry. And basically if we just draw two lines through the lungs, we can, we can talk about things in relation to zones. So if there's a mass sitting up here, it's much easier to say the left upper zone than try and say for sure that it's definitely the right upper lobe because if you remember looking at our oblique fissure it kind of it spans it could span all three of these zones potentially certainly on the left side it could span all three of those zones so you're just gonna you're less likely to find yourself in hot water shall we say if you describe things zonally rather than trying to put all your money on it definitely being in a certain lobe does that make sense Something bad has happened. Ooh. I have lost my presentation. Yeah, it's back. Okay. <laughs> so um, a useful thing um, to have a clear idea in your head um, is of review areas. So we've probably all heard this term bandied around um, and it might mean slightly different things to different people, but once we've moved through our structured interpretation of a chest x-ray, as we will soon discuss. Um, it's really important um, for us as clinicians to, to not miss things, to just go back to that image and check several areas to make sure that we're not missing, hiding sneaky pathology. Um, so the kind of key review areas that it's really helpful to check again is just all the areas that's highlighted on this screen. So the apices, both apices, it's really important to check. Um, things like small pneumothoraces might be hiding up there, um, possibly small masses um, like to hide in the apices as well, so give those a little check. The hyla structures on both sides, the hyla and the perihyla regions, there's a lot going on there, there's vessels, there's large bronchi, um, lymph nodes can enlarge and cause those hyla to look very bulky and irregular, so it's really important to just cast an eye back over the hyla regions on both sides. Um, and check that there's nothing hiding there. Now, obviously there's lung sitting behind the heart. Um, so we need to try and look at it. It can be a bit confusing to look at because there's obviously a big heart shadow sitting on top of it. But as you can so, sort of see in this image, there are lung markings behind the heart shadow. So just make sure that you have a little look at those um, and look for any irregularities there. And then another thing that's easy to forget is how much lung is hiding behind the hemidiaphragms on both sides. Um, so as we can sort of see in this image as well, there are uh, vessel markings extending behind the hemidiaphragm. So it's great to check those too. And if you do that, every time you look at a chest x-ray, you're just much less likely to miss things. Um, yeah. Okay. 
So the GI tract, obviously we're looking at chest x-rays today, um, but we can see a lot um, of what's going on in different systems on a chest x-ray. Um, so we've of course got quite a lot of the cardiovascular system going on here with the heart and the great vessels. You can see the descending aorta coming down here with this stripe. Um, but there's also quite a lot going on from a GI perspective. We've got um, the esophagus um, midline structure, which sits behind the trachea in the back of the mediastinum, which should just go straight down the middle, um, pass through the diaphragm at the middle and then open up into the stomach. And then we see the stomach bubble there as well. Um, so this little collection of gas here is the stomach bubble, affectionately termed. Um, it can come in lots of different shapes and sizes, um, but just bear in mind that it's quite normal to have this bit of gas, usually on, under the left side of the, of the diaphragm. So that is just, oh my goodness, I'm back. <laughs> that is just a picture of what that is supposed to look like. Um, just kind of demonstrating where you're likely to see things. So um, esophagus coming down, gastroesophageal junction roughly in the midline there, and then the stomach extending out into the left with the stomach bubble. Okay, right, I've made it. Um, so now we're gonna, I'm gonna hand over to Sam and we'll talk a little bit about structured interpretation. Um, does anyone have any questions about the anatomy on chest x-rays? Obviously that really was very basic. Um, there is a lot more going on on chest x-rays um, that we can see, um, but kind of didn't feel very relevant for medical students. So I haven't really talked about that, but any questions? Stunned silence. Sorry, how do you differentiate the zones on the x-ray? Do you want to just go back to that? Okay, slide? yeah. So, so the answer to that question, someone someone typed in, um, how do you differentiate the zones on, on the x-ray? And I suppose the answer is there's no hard and fast, you know, anatomical marker. It's not like we, you know, find the AP window or some vertebra level and always draw a line through that. It's much more just, as we've done here, is basically to two fairly evenly distributed lines that, that roughly divide it into equal segments. Obviously, the apices are quite different from, from the bases, um, but they're just roughly equal segments. Um, and so, yeah, there's probably a little bit of interpretation on, you know, if a mass was here, is that is that lower zone or middle zone? And I suppose the answer, it doesn't really matter um, as long as you're just kind of as accurate as you can be. But thank you for that question. Okay. Great. Um, should say, so we've got another computer here that we're logged into. I'm just going to change seats because this one's a little bit squeaky. Um, but we do have a laptop up here that's got the chat up. So if you do want to type in questions, we are trying to keep an eye on it, but I'm independently signing in and out of it. But otherwise, just shout out any questions. We're not too fussy. So now that Fran's gone through sort of the anatomy of the X-ray, we'll just chop out um, chest X-rays themselves. So I guess firstly, you want to say, when you're looking at the x-ray you want to see is this x-ray any good sort of assessing the technical qualities and factors of the x-ray and then after that basically just say what you see um, and i guess about that thing is don't really be afraid um, about doing that and it's not necessarily that you have to have the diagnosis straight away and often just by saying what you see you'll talk yourself into a correct diagnosis you might not immediately be able to say that this looks like heart failure by looking at x-ray immediately be able to say things like this heart looks big and there looks to be pleural effusions and it looks like there's opacity sort of in the center throughout both of the chests and you'll be able to get there eventually so just say what you see and the last point then i guess is putting it all together in its context so that's important because chest x-rays aren't just a chest x-ray for the sake of it they're being done to find out something to exclude something and um, often the request may not tell you what that's for um, but when you're looking at x-rays on the ward you'll know why you're looking for it and what you want to do about it um, I guess for exams if you're given an x-ray the next question might be great you've identified this what would you do next or what's the treatment for that and um, we'll probably not talk about as much on that third point today um, but it is important to know that obviously you're doing a chest x-ray for a reason so try and sort of think of next steps as part of the management of the patient. We're stuck on this slide. Perfect, here we go. Um, so the first part we want to do about um, assessing the x-ray then is its projection. Um, so AP versus PA, and then obviously there's position as well. Um, so that can be if the patient is standing up or they're half standing up or they're lying down. 
And regarding the projection points, um, AP and PA, does anyone know what they mean? We often see them in the top left of the X-ray. No, that's fine. It's, um, it? Oh yeah, go I, for it. I was gonna say, is it anterior, posterior, or posterior, anterior, like the direction exactly. that the that's X-rays are traveling. Exactly, back yourself. That's exactly right. Um, so um, quite often they'll put in, um, if it's an AP, it's sort of assumed that most uh, ideal chest X-rays are PA. So quite often we'll put in if it's an actually an AP film. Does anyone know why they add that extra bit of detail in? So PA is the ideal one. So um, the lung is a bigger, it's got a deeper surface on the back, whereas the anterior, it's kind of occupied by the, the heart and other, you know, livers and organs kind of push it away. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And particularly, does anyone know what that can sort of lead to? That's exactly the answer. Um, but does anyone know if that can lead to some problems when they're sort of assessing something on a chest X-ray? Something might look a little bit different or... Yes, someone's just mentioned here. So the anterior posterior makes the heart look big, right? So you can't tell if it's cardiomegaly or not. Your spelling is okay. We got to show what you meant. Um, and that's ex exactly right. Um, so a way I remember this um, in medical school that we were taught is that APs are crap for looking at the heart. Um, so C-R-A-P. Um, and that is because on this next slide, hopefully we'll see. Pranus, So hopefully we'll see it here. Um, this is essentially what this patient would be standing up, PA, and this would be an AP film here. So you can see how the beam is coming from this machine here and coming the whole way to the patient here, producing this lovely image. And if we pretend these are the same image or same patient, even though they're not, because obviously one is in recess and she doesn't look like she's in recess. But this way you can see that the heart is actually much magnified um, compared to over here. Now this recess patient may have cardiomegaly, but it actually could just be a lot of projection. So quite often what you might see on X-ray reports is this is an AP film, so the heart size cannot be accurately assessed. Um, so that is the way of doing it. And this is sort of an explanation for why. So if you're imagining that this is the, you know, the X-ray source is coming from here and where the beam is coming out and by the part where the beam is converging um, here, this is getting us an accurate representation of the heart, the PA coming through the patient's posterior to their anterior, so from the back to their chest. But here you can see that these added red bits on the side is actually projection of what the heart would look like. But obviously the heart hasn't increased in size between these two, it's just where the x-ray has been taken from. So it could lead to you to overcall things that aren't necessarily there. So it's just a good idea to have a quick look and see if there's any reason why you wouldn't expect things to look normal on this scan. So we've gone through our projection then, and we've gone through the positioning. Um, so that would begin is the difference between the two that we saw there, but that's supine as well. I guess another thing we should talk about in positioning is that sometimes because people aren't ideally positioned standing up as they are over here on the left, is that some parts of it can be cut off at times or patients, if they're quite unwell, their heads or their chins can get in the way. And so that can obviously lead to difficulties with the technical factors. So has anyone heard of, well, that was the first one for you already. Has anyone heard of any other way to identify sort of technical factors about films? Has anyone heard of any acronym for it? Hopefully it may have just popped up there for some people. So on the question, and then I'm writing in the thing. Is that, they're on Zoom now. Yeah. yeah, so, and does anyone know what the rotation is for art? Yeah, someone's going, Alfie's going through it, perfect. So it's there, acronym is RIPE, is a good way to think about it. So R-I-P-E, um, and that is the way to, you can just quickly work through um, x-rays. So the first one stands for rotation. So what we mean by that is, is the patient, where the x-ray is coming from, are they sort of facing straight onto that? So rotation here is measured by the clavicles outlined here in yellow. So are the clavicle clavicular heads, are they equidistant from the spinous processes running down the middle of the film? So I wouldn't say it's maybe too important for you to get hung up on whether the patient is rotated to the left or whether they're rotated to the right. Um, but I would just say that it is important because obviously if there is rotation there, this structure and the mediastinum and the heart that's in the middle will obviously be a bit pushed off to one side or the other. So might the trachea, all the stuff that should be running in the middle, you might think that actually looks a bit skewed to one side and you might call things that actually is just 
part of the film. And so it's not um, common for those things uh, to happen because sometimes the patient might not be able to be positioned that way. Um, so it's just important to have a quick assessment of that. As Alfie's nicely written out for us in the comments, the next one is for inspiration. So does anyone know about how we measure inspiration on chest x-rays, what things we look at? No, nope, that's okay. Um, or maybe you do in our shy. In which case you look at the ribs basically um, and you wanna see how many ribs you can get on the x-ray for how well inspired the film is. Right, um, so here's the sort of two differences between under-inspired and a well-inspired film. So a way of doing that actually, if you look at this one on the left, you might think, oh, it looks, we say the lower zones, we'll avoid the lobes for now. We say the lower zones bilaterally, it looks, you know, there's a bit more fluffy opacification or it doesn't look like maybe something going on here at the bottom of both lungs. Um, uh, who pretend for this sake that maybe this could be the same x-ray of a different um, patient here and just with um, better inspiration, you can see actually, oh no, the lower zones are actually okay. There's nothing too concerned in there. And really what's happened there is when your lungs aren't inspired, you imagine all that is compressed down and it's just x-rays going through stuff that aren't, is inspired. A way to assess that really is you want there to be five to seven anterior ribs in sort of in the mid clavicular line at the level before you get to the diaphragm. So anterior ribs, if we think of a PA film, which we're assuming this one is because I haven't mentioned it's AP. So with a PA film, x-rays coming from sort of here and going through this way. The anterior ribs are these ones that curl around at the front. So I often find maybe this a bit difficult because I think, oh, you can count ribs and you sort of count all of these horizontal ones here, but they tend to be the posterior ones. So the anterior ones are this one here coming down, this one here coming down, this one here coming down, and that one there. You can also count it through the posterior ribs, which are the horizontal ones, which sometimes are a bit easier to count. They can get a bit tricky once you get near the top. So you want there to basically be somewhere between eight to 10 posterior ribs before you hit the level of the diaphragm. So you can see here, you can see there's one anterior rib, uh, one, two, three, probably maybe you're starting to four before the diaphragm. Whereas here we can see there's one, two, three, four, five, and just the start of the sixth rib coming there. But in the middle of the line, we're at the fifth one. So it's perfect, that's what you want. Inspiration is also important to talk about for things such as this. So in this chest x-ray, we're seeing hyperinflation and hopefully that might ring some um, alarm bells you may have heard of, not so much alarming, but it's just, um, it's a very common feature that you get in COPD and um, conditions with sort of bullae formation. You're seeing that in this compared to the previous x-rays, the diaphragms here are much flatter. So you get flattening of the high hemi diaphragms. And if we're counting the ribs here, we go one, two, three, four, five, six. We definitely have seven, which is, but when we go posterior ribs, the horizontal ones, we can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and there's actually another one. So you can see there's quite a lot there. So you can see that this is hyperinflated. That's not necessarily a technical factor of the x-ray, but it's just something that you can pick up on that can give a clue to underlying disease processes that's going on. That all making sense for everyone so far, the first two. Can I can I ask a question about um, Please. Ina inadequate inspiration? Is, is there a way of telling the difference between someone having inadequate inspiration and there being like a pathology in the lower zone? So I guess you technically would, again, you basically would want to see this way then is if they're having enough ribs coming through. So even if there was a pathology, for instance, in this patient's sort of left lower zone here on the right, you could still count out the ribs here and say, actually, no, they have inspired enough. Also, you should still be able to see it's, on this, the pathology here, there's only these sort of ribs that are peeking through. Whereas if there's pathology here, you'd still probably be able to count actually the ribs through that. Does that make sense? So pathology here, I'm still able to, it probably won't obscure the ribs completely. So I'll still be able to count them. Pathology here, yes, you'd say, well, you know, it might be a bit pathology here, but it's unlikely that it's going to be covering completely the bottom two ribs. 
So you're only getting three that are projecting here anyway. So it's unlikely that whatever you're seeing is so dense you're not actually able to see ribs through it. If that makes sense. Well, oh, thank you. So now we move on to P, um, which Alfie's written as picture, uh, and that is fair enough. Some people say picture, some people penetration. Um, I guess just fix this and then stick to it. And we've gone for penetration here. Go look back at these ones. Penetration you assess by looking at um, the vertebral bodies. So you can see them nicely lined out through here behind the heart. You can see them all stacked upon each other, quite nice a little gap in between them. Whereas over here on the left, quite difficult to make out where sort of any of the vertebral bodies are. You know that it'll be in the midline. You can see the spinous processes here. But do tend to get a little bit lost here. And that's important because if something is over or under penetrated, and um, which can happen, it's quite difficult to either see things or see things accurately. So you want to be able to basically assess something like this. This is obviously the ideal here. And the last one, obviously, then we said is E. And um, again, people might have different ones for this um, for terms of exposure, because that might people might put that under penetration for under or overexposed films, for instance. But we've gone for P for penetration and E for exposure. Basically, for this, you want to make sure the entire lung fields are exposed. And um, so you want to get ever, catch everything in the chest X-ray from the apices to the costophrenic angles. Um, because it may happen that um, on the first X-ray you didn't um, get completely all of the chest image, um, and it's quite often um, that patients are a bit too unwell to necessarily be in one position for too long, um, but the radiographers are very good and pick up on this quite quickly, and so you might be tempted to say that, oh, they're not all the film is here, but actually there may be a second film that might catch the lung bases that weren't properly visualised on the second. So we've gone through how to sort of assess technical factors of it, and then we'll quickly go through and um, sort of saying what we see, and then we'll move on to some cases to finish up. Um, so, as in medicine and all things, there are um, good acronyms that we've gone through already there and things like RIPE and stuff like that, but ABCD will follow you around as a junior doctor for all your life. And it's a good one um, for chest x-rays. So does anyone know what any of these stand for when looking at chest x-ray? Feel free to shout out or type or whatever. Here we. Uh-huh, perfect. Any others? Breathing. Great. You're on a roll, you can keep going. Circulation. Great. <laughs> um, I think the disability, I'm not sure if that's correct, but E is for exposure. So yeah, you're right. And D is sometimes disability when you look at as when you assess someone if you're called to see them. And the handy thing, I guess, is A, B, and C are the same. So airways, breathing, and circulation. So that'll get drummed into you everywhere. D for chest x-rays, we look at diaphragms, then I guess is a good way to look at it. And E, some people might put this as different, you might say extras, um, we go for everything else here. So all the stuff that maybe isn't necessarily in the chest. So if you think of the first ones or the things, the parts of the anatomy you're looking at as the chest, E can be the bones at the side or the soft tissues that you might see, but also things like lines and tubes. And so that was just here. And this is also another thing you might find on Life in the Fast Lane, which I'm sure, um, like Geeky Medics and Life in the Fast Lane, you probably will have heard of. Here's just another one that they got for it, which is Doctors A, B, C, D, E. Um, so getting patient's details um, and making sure it's the right patient and the right film and the right time that you're looking at. Then it's got this ripe in here. And then they've got soft tissue and bones and then airway breathing, as we discussed all here. I guess, importantly, it's just, have a system that works for you and that you find comfortable using um, and use it consistently is probably the key thing. So it's all very well having a system, but if you, the third or the fourth chest x-ray you do, you decide to change system and um, you're probably gonna miss stuff out. So it's just ideal to have a system that works for you. You don't have to obviously use these prescribed ones, um, but if you can remember it, great, you can keep a stick to it. So that's us gone through how to assess the technical factors of the film, what things we're particularly looking at on the film um, in terms of this airway breathing and all of that. And then we also know the anatomy of it. I should go back through this just before we go into the cases. I say that what we're looking for at each of these sections, so with the A and the B and the C and the D, we're looking for sort of different things, particularly on the majestic, so there's different stuff that we want to see. So for the airway, for instance, we might see is that 
the trachea or the bronchi, can we see then is the trachea deviated? That's obviously concerning. Is it coming off to the one of the sides? The breathing, we're looking at the lungs themselves then, and we'll have a look through them in some of our cases. And is there any opacity, which any whiteness really? Is that whiteness in a circle? Is it in one area? Is it throughout both lungs? Is it fluffy? Um, is it, does it look like maybe there's fluid or something like that there? The circulation, we're looking at the heart then, looking at the heart borders. Can we see the outline of the heart nice and clear? Is there anything that's obscuring that? And from going through the anatomy with Fram, we know for instance that the right middle lobe sits right beside the right heart border. So if you lose the right heart border, is there something that's in the right middle lobe that means we're losing that? And um, we can also assess things like the heart size not on an AP film as we've gone through, but a PA film, we can measure the heart relative to the thoracic ratio. And so that's the cardiothoracic ratio and see whether that's um, over 0.55 or whether there's any signs of cardiomegaly there. The diaphragm, as Fran has said, there's lungs that go below the diaphragm too, posteriorly. So you can still have a review area there, but also you can have a look at sort of the costophrenic angles there. It's also important for assessing for things like free air under the diaphragm. And everything else then, I guess, um, we're looking for the bones. You, know, you can get humeral head fractures, you might have seen here, or clavicle fractures. They're obviously going to be included, but also you might think that NG tubes or chest strains um, or other bits and pieces that might be on the chest or indeed in the chest that you might want to comment on. Um, but we'll go through some cases and hopefully we'll um, be able to see some of those in a bit more detail. Um, we've got a few cases. Um, it probably will work um, well if for the first few, maybe you sort of have this system where you say um, you're looking at the airway, you're looking at breathing, something like that, and just talk through it um, for your benefit, for also everyone's benefit to sort of hammer home that message. Um, but um, in real life, you still probably will do this as well. Um, but for the sake of time and stuff, once we get through the first few, maybe we'll just start speaking about what the abnormality is that you can see, but just we'll ask you to work your way through these things. For the cases, it's probably best if people are a bit brave and just speak out. Um, you can type if you want to, but um, it's a very safe learning environment. Um, you have two ST1s here, so definitely not scary consultants. Um, so just say what you see, exactly what you're saying there, and say, you know, in the left lung, there is a part in the lower zone that looks a bit more white. Perfect. That's great. That's what we want. Yeah. One of the trickiest things about um, trying to interpret chest x-rays is not necessarily identifying that there's something weird going on but it's actually putting that into words so feel free to just have a stab um, and we can talk about the different ways um, of describing what we're seeing in those chest x-rays as well so um, if you say something that maybe sounds a bit weird that's great we can all talk about it and learn from it and maybe think about um, a, a better way or just a different way of describing what we're seeing as well so yeah don't be afraid to have a go um thank you in advance for your participation <laughs> um so i'll just go to the first um, one then so this is a seven year old female who's been complaining of a fever and a cough and is feeling quite short of breath so just for this first one if someone wants to just um go through that sort of a to a b c d e system um, I should say all of our cases have come from Radiopedia, so you can assume that their technical factors are adequate. Um, it's good to think, still think about that thing. It's important. That's obviously why I've spoke about AP or PA and the right. Um, but for the sake of time and to not hear the same things over and over again, just assume that the technical factors are accurate and are adequate. Um, so if someone wants to give this one a go, that would be superb. And sure, take a second to decide what you think as well. That's fine. We can take it in turns as well. Someone could tell us what's going on with the airway here. That's a nice start. Yes, Alfie said airway is central and you are absolutely correct. So that's A ticked off. I don't mind having a go. Yeah. The quality sort of changes uh, randomly, so I might get lost at some point. Um, 
but yeah, following the airway dam is central. You can just about see the two main bronchi, mm -hmm. and they don't they don't look deviated uh, or anything. I agree. Um, in terms of if you're doing airway and mediastinum, I can't see any obvious mediastinal widening. You can see like the is that like the aortic knob or not? Sure. Yeah, the aortic knuckle. Where is that? Yeah. Knuckle. There we yeah. are. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one of the case, so you can see that, but it doesn't look super wide, um, from what I can tell. Breathing wise, if you like, look at the lung fields, um, they they seem to be visible all the way around the edge of the ribs, so there doesn't seem to be any obvious like area where there's no lung field within the, mm -hmm. the two sides. Um, on the right hand, sort of like middle lower zone, there's this like area of whiteness opacity if i was to go right yeah what that we mean yeah exactly um, and i guess it's a bit you can it's hard to tell with the with the quality through the internet but it's sort of a bit harder to see the cardiac shadow there on that side as well i guess so that comes into c um so you can see the uh the cardiac shadow quite clearly on the left side I can't tell because of the because of the quality on the right side. Sorry. Um, That's okay. Yeah, whether you can see it uh, that well. Uh, is there anything else in circulation other than heart size? I mean, the heart size looks looks all right. It looks like less than half, just about. Yeah, exactly. And to be honest, eyeballing is what most people do most of the time. A, a handy little tip um, is if you reckon you can fit the bit of the heart in the right side of the chest into the space remaining in the left side of the chest, you probably roughly got just maybe a helpful eyeballing tip. But yeah, you're doing very well. And cool. I think you're right, yeah. Thanks. And then uh, D, both the diaphragms, you can see quite clearly. Um, the right one's a little bit raised, which you'd expect compared to the left. Um, they're not flattened. Um, they both go down to those angles quite like neatly and sharply. Um, there's no air under the right diaphragm, and I'll, I'll hazard a guess that that's a, a stomach bubble under the left diaphragm. Good guess. Yeah. Um, e, everything else. I can't see any obvious, you know, uh, non-organic things like N NG tubes or chest tubes. Chest tubes. Um, um, bone bone wise. wise. Oh, I'm getting oh, some feedback. feedback. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I can't see any obvious fractures in the bones. It's a bit hard to see the the spine in this uh, in, with the quality, but it looks all right. Um, anything else and everything else? That's it. That's it. Pretty good to me. Um, so you've done exactly the right thing there. You've gone through. You've said, and um, technically, you've also included technical factors by how it's projected over the internet. So perfect. And um, don't be afraid to say if things aren't good enough for you to see and um, what you can say uh, sorry don't be afraid to say if you can't see well enough i can't see well enough you've gone through systematically in a b c d e great you've identified sort of the area that we're looking at here um, and you've sort of said where that is and you said what it's near um, if you cannot see the heart border that clearly over the projection apologies but you can take our word for it but yes um this left heart border here that i'm just tracing out now is nice and crisp and clear. Sometimes it can get a bit, maybe a bit fluffy here where there's a bit of a fat pad, but you can still see it trace around here. Whereas on the right, we can start coming down here and maybe just about here where this whiteness starts to happen, we sort of lose things a little bit. Um, so maybe a bit difficult to see there's here on the, on the chat, we've had um, some people chatting about it as well too, and they've said the same, this bit of opacity in the right middle area or middle zone, which is a nice use of the term area or zone, and um, rather than getting too caught up necessarily where it is. We will say maybe about this one um, is that you can use sort of clues um, to work out uh, where this particular pathology is. Um, so as Fran, I'm not sure if the next slide goes immediately to it, but as Fran, when she was going over the anatomy at the start, we know that what sits right next to the right heart border is the right middle lobe. And what sits mostly on top of the right hemidiaphragm is the right lower lobe for the most part. 
Um, that actually, if you can still see all of the right diaphragm okay, but you've still lost a bit of the right heart border, this is probably going to be a right middle loop pathology. Um, given that it sounds like a fever and a cough and a bit shorter breath, sounds like a chest infection. And given that's a chest infection that's got x-ray evidence, you can say that this is a pneumonia. So you could say that this patient has a right middle lobe pneumonia. However, you can also just say this patient looks like they have got a right lower zone infection or inflammation process, or they've got consolidation or opacity in their right lower mid to lower zone. And they would all be absolutely fair things to say. Um, great. Yeah, I think you described that well, uh, Declan. It, de it definitely is more white, um, but you use an even better word immediately after saying that, which was a pacification. Um, and I think that's a very appropriate descriptive term for what we're seeing here. Um, and when when people use the word patchy, um, <clears throat> but this isn't like a very clearly defined area, is it? We can see that it's more white, but there's not a definite edge to that whiteness. So just calling that kind of bit of patchy pacification is probably quite a nice, accurate way of saying what's going on here. Um, yeah, well done. That makes sense to everyone. Anyone got any questions on that one? Either with the mic or on the chat. Otherwise we'll move yeah, on. In the interest of time, we can maybe focus on the major pathologies for these ones moving forward, just so that we can try and get through a few more before we've got to. So keep the A to E system in your head, but just work through it. And whenever you get to the part that looks abnormal, you can let us know. So this is a 50 year old female who's got some sudden onset abdominal pain, severe. So if anyone wants to be in the chats or say out so you can work your way through a to e in your head and hopefully at some point you'll come across something that looks abnormal maybe some neuro pneumoperitoneum some the seepit of a gas bubble underneath the, the right diaphragm yeah that's absolutely right and someone said it in the chat too as well there is something strange going on with the diaphragm so you've maybe worked away you see the a is central the lungs themselves look okay these are just sort of the hyalur vessels and um, uh, the heart probably is fine. Then we've gone to A, B, C, D, and we think, oh, well, there is something underneath this lung maybe here that there actually looks like there's more lung below the diaphragm or more that you can see, and it looks a bit unusual. Um, and this area of lucency or area of air is yeah, free air under the diaphragm, so pneumoperitoneum. So this sort of thin strip here would be actually where the air is separating the diaphragm up from the rest of it. And if you can sort of remember, it's a bit different from the gastric bubble that Fran showed earlier, because it's got a very thin separation between it. So there's air here, obviously, and there's air here, and there's also only a very thin thing between it. So the gastric bubble is sort of got quite a thick stomach surrounding it, obviously. And also the gastric bubble has that classic air fluid line in it, where the air is sort of sitting on top of the gastric contents. Yeah, so in, you're absolutely right. This is pneumoperitoneum, which just means air in the peritoneal cavity. Um, and in order to see this, there has to be a pretty significant air leak within the peritoneal cavity. So this isn't a very common finding. Um, but something worth bearing in mind, if you were to come across this on the wards with someone who was actually very well and didn't necessarily have any pain, is that maybe has that patient had a recent procedure? Um, when we do laparoscopic surgery, they pump CO2 into the abdominal cavity so that they can see what's going on in there. Um, so if someone was pretty recent uh, post-op, um, you may well find this incidentally, as it were. So it's not necessarily a feature of pathology, but if you had someone presenting, like in this case, um, this would be a pretty clear indication of some kind of perforated organ. Um, so usually because this air has got to come from somewhere, usually it's the GI tract, which has popped at some point, which is leading to all this air collecting under the diaphragm. Well done. Good so and now we have a 76 year old man who has presented, let's say to Amy, um, acutely short of breath. So again, have a little look, see what you think. Um, and if someone is up for uh, typing or, or uh, talking through what they think is going on, or even just describing what they see as we've discussed. Sorry if it's not projecting very well with the internet.
So yeah, we've had someone mm -hmm. message in saying that there's a right middle to lower zone opacity. And there is a slight clue that just appeared on the screen there. So maybe you saw that. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's a totally fair thing to say about this, but we could potentially add to that. Yeah. About the E, I guess we could say, does anyone know what this is sitting in the chest? Is it a pacemaker? Yeah. Spot on, yeah. So it is It is something like that. Um, it could well be a pacemaker, but what we see on this line, which I wouldn't expect any of you to know, is there's a bit of a thickening in the wire. Can people appreciate that? So we've got wire, thicker wire, and then less thick wire coming out. And usually this is something that we see with implanted um, cardiac defibrillators. So um, you're right, it can be very hard to tell the difference between an ICD and a pacemaker, but generally if you see wires with some insulation on them like this, um, it's much, much more likely to be a, a defib rather than just a pacemaker. Um, but yes, it's some kind of cardiac device. With that clue then of a cardiac device, and um, that leads us to think of a particular type of patient. Um, so if someone has yeah there seems to be some chat about it as well someone's acutely short of breath and you know that they have a cardiac issue what sort of things could cause that and yeah that's it we've got we've got heart failure we've got pulmonary edema all the right words, all the right being words coming said. through the chat exactly so yeah what what um you may be talking about earlier alpha here with the right middle and lower zone of pacification um this is kind of quite a classic distribution of some um alveolar edema that we see in in pulmonary edema and heart failure. And this distribution is typically central. Um, so you're right, we've got a pacification in the middle and the lower zone. But if you look on the other side, I think there's probably also middle and lower zone of pacification on the left side. So it's kind of bilateral, quite widespread um, a pacification, which is more central than it is peripheral. I think it's probably quite clear that the lung at the periphery is darker than the lung kind of peri highly if that is a word not sure if that's a word um so yeah we've got some people call this bat wing um bat wings as a sign but just describing it as perihyla pacification is is just as good if not better um did anyone notice these little lines coming in at the edge it's fine if you didn't they're quite I'm hard sure to see in a slide so yeah anyone seen those or maybe have any clue what they might be Are they curly B lines? Absolutely. Yeah, well then, um, they are. So they're a representation of some interstitial edema as well. So the way that sort of the architect of um, the lung, architecture of the lungs, I guess, sort of around it, you have the veins sort of draining them. And obviously when they get congested, and um, that's where fluid can uh, gather. And that's what you're seeing a representation of here. Um, so you may have heard some things about heart failure on chest x-ray it's uh, another acronym apologies um, but it's an easy one to remember because it's also a b c d e um so it's an easy one to remember as well so it's a sign that you might see so you'd see the alveolar edema and um, which is for a and what's that back swing that fran was talking about then you see these curly b lines for b and you might see evidence of cardiomegaly for c then you may see what they call um is a dilated upper venous lobe oh, distribution, which diversion. is diversion, diversion. Yeah, so it's where you'll see that actually the because if you imagine the bottom of the lungs are slowly filling up with fluid, or this is how I think about it, if the bottom of the lungs are slowly filling up with fluid, then basically you get more blood is going to the top of the lungs to try and get better aeration and to parts where there's more air transfer that can happen because obviously it's a bit significantly limited with the fluid at the bottom and um, which is also the E which is the effusions that you can get at the bottom which aren't here because you can still see those crisp clear costophrenic angles but yeah so it's A, B, C, D, E again. But yeah nice one. Um, yeah it's like your vasculature has a mind of its own and it realizes that the bases are useless so it diverts all the blood for oxygenation to the more aerated part of the lungs um uh yeah nice one so that's kind of typical heart failure so what we've got now is a 65 year old lady who has presented with cough and shortness of breath um yeah any thoughts
So this one might be a tiny bit tricky, particularly if you've never come across it before. Um, but what we're seeing here is um, a pretty classic representation of what's called the sale sign. Has anyone heard of the sale sign before? No worries if not. So can I convince you all that there's an extra little line going on in the left hemithorax, which is going through the left heart border, um, extending from the midline. Now this is our sale. Um, anyone know what that might be? Is it the oblique fissure on that side? So it's sort of, it is and it isn't, yeah. Um, so what it is, is a collapsed lower lobe, left lower lobe. And because that lobe has collapsed, um, what is usually nice black aerated lung is now white, dense, collapsed, soft tissue, essentially. So you see this color here is more or less the same density as soft tissues we're seeing in the arm or in the abdomen. And that's because that collapsed no longer aerated tissue has now basically become the same density as maybe the liver, for example. Um, so this is a very classic uh, representation of what happens when that lobe collapses. It can collapse for any number of reasons. Um, it might be that um, there's a tumor blocking the bronchus that supplies it or something like that. I could, there isn't in this case, but there's lots of different reasons why we can get collapses, but this is what it looks like typically. Um, this kind of triangle extending out from the midline. Um, and yeah, essentially, that density of tissue. Uh, we still, this demonstrates how the, the lobe can extend through the whole hemithorax. So what we're seeing here is left upper lobe, but we still have kind of aerated lung from the very top to the very bottom. So that's why it's a bit easier to describe things zonally rather than uh, in terms of lobes when it comes to, to describing chest x-rays. So yeah, next time you see it, you'll know. Would it look the same on the other side? If you had a right lower lobe? Well, we'll go through some of those things, but you remember that on the right side, you also have the middle lobe to contend with as well, which is absent on the left side. So things look a little bit different, but we'll catch, we'll catch through some of those things and we'll see. A good question. So this is the next one here. So again, just in your head, work your way through your A to E, but hopefully when you come across something that looks a bit abnormal in that system, you can talk about that. Anyone on the chat? Sorry, I'll just jump back to the chat. Anyone finding anything abnormal there or any part that looks peculiar? Yeah, you don't need to say anything more than that. You can just say that bit looks weird. Oh, someone's very smart and has said the golden S sign and they are absolutely right. Does that person want to describe what golden S sign means for maybe those, those of us who don't? Like, I would never have heard of this before, and um, particularly not in medical school. So I'm sure some well meaning people tried to teach me, but didn't. That's fine if you don't want to say. Uh, we will describe it for you all, but you're absolutely right. That is the golden S sign. Um, so, what we're seeing here, can everyone appreciate there's this big kind of maybe soft tissue density, if we can liken the color of this to the color of this, um, rounded lesion or something like that in the, in the hilum. So this is um, essentially just a big hilar mass. And what it's doing is causing collapse of the upper lobe of the right lung. So this line here is actually a displaced horizontal fissure. So you remember previously that the horizontal fissure usually goes across something like that um, in the right hemithorax, but because all of the lung tissue above it has been collapsed, what's happened is that line has been pulled upwards. Um, so what we see is a much higher curvy looking kind of horizontal fissure, I suppose, um, with a, a denser 
zone above it where we have collapsed lung and this turns into um, a golden S sign rather than just a right upper lobe collapse when we also have a mass at the hilum which is essentially causing that process to happen. Um, so yeah. So yeah, so someone said um, in the chat again, it's typically an upper lobe collapse, which is correct. Um, but just the, the golden S part of it is because you end up getting that other part of the curve, as Fran was just saying. So this sort of explains here the blue line, that horizontal fissure should be like this. Because the lung above it has collapsed down, so rather than it all being filled with air, if you imagine it's collapsed down, it's pulled that up with it. Um, because I think a thing to remember, but it's quite helpful about the chest, is that things will expand to fit the chest so there's not just going to be a big empty so if this is here and it's on top and this collapses down this isn't just going to stay here and you're not going to have anything in between here this will pull up so fill the whole chest as well which is what we're seeing here and outlined in this diagram yeah um so i realize that we've probably gone on longer than we should have um and people might have some questions they want to ask either about this presentation or about other things to do with radiology so i'll give you an option here we do have a few more cases that we could do um but i think they're gonna send the slides out as well so you could equally just look at them in your own time if you would prefer to do that um or we could just stop there now and if people had questions they'd be very welcome to ask them or if people don't have questions and want to do one or two more cases, then, then we can do that. What would be yeah, we're, we're the happy consensus? Yeah, preference. Feel free to message in your vote <laughs> yeah. or say nothing at all. Or just all leave at once if that's the feeling. Okay, we'll do one or two more cases unless anyone objects. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Happy to be there, but I have a question too. Yeah, we'll leave time for questions. We can do a few more cases and we'll leave some questions. Grand. Okay, a couple more cases. Um, so yeah, this was just to review um, what we were kind of talking about already. So this is normally where we find the horizontal fissure. Um, if you imagine when this whole line collapses, this line isn't going to stay where we would expect it to do. It will shoot upwards. Um, and that's what's happened in that case. Um, and then likewise, when if you remember the case Prior to that, with the lower, left lower lobe collapse and the sail sign, um, what's happened is this whole blue area has collapsed down into that little triangle. Um, and yeah, the, the oblique fissure doesn't remain where we would expect it to. So if we looked at that on a lateral film, um, it, would, it would be pushed all the way back down here towards, towards the middle. Okay, so case number six. So read it for yourself, but it's a yeah, 32 year old male who's presented with left sided chest pain. Now, if you're not seeing this clearly, this might be quite hard to tell. So do your best. Um, but if really you're not seeing anything, then we can just talk people through it as well. Is it a, a left-sided pneumothorax? Ah, oh, very good. Yes, well done. Exactly. So hopefully you're working your system, A, B, C, D, E, and all that. But when you get to B, you're looking at the lungs, and hopefully up here you've noticed in also the review areas that actually these lung markings that you can see here and that you can see all throughout the right lung actually stop quite abruptly just around here. You can actually see another line here and this big area of lucency meaning just essentially air that's there because that is essentially what you're x-raying at that point and um, so you're seeing this air lucency that is actually in between where the lung should normally come up the whole way up here so which is the pneumothorax mm -hmm. great and that's a pretty big one you're right so we would usually do something about that we wouldn't just watch and wait um but that's another conversation so yeah well done pneumothorax uh, pretty common in young men as well so and they won't necessarily have any previous lung pathology um so yeah okay so so we've got a 60 year old man who's presented with some swallowing issues um that's what he's presented with then they've done various things to him and we've taken this chest x-ray so <laughs> anyone like to hazard a guess at what's going on here
Has his, <clears throat> sorry, has his NG choosing put uh, in the wrong hole, basically? Absolutely yes, right. Well, it's, it's gone in the right hole, but has come out one of the wrong ones at the bottom, exactly. So um, this is the NG tube here that I'm just outlining. Now this part here, don't get too confused by it, because um, quite often you have to remember that x-ray is obviously x-raying everything that's in front of the patient. So this is the part of the NG that's hanging out of the patient, probably. And this is probably the part that's going up to his nose. And this is now coming down through. So it's gone being inserted down his nose, and now it's coming down through. And hopefully it will be going through his esophagus. But having a look through here, we can see that actually it looks like it's sort of careering over here to the right and sort of as we talked about earlier about that right main bronchus obviously being a bit steeper sometimes it can be the area where things go a bit quicker and um, so this is a misplaced ng tube yeah um and this is a really key thing to recognize it's a never event to feed someone through um a an ng tube which is essentially in their lungs because then we're just giving them an iatrogenic aspiration pneumonia essentially um so the key things that we need to check when we're as junior doctors, for example, or medical students in an exam, checking an NG post-insertion chest x-ray, um, we need to identify the carina, which is the bifurcation or the branching of the trachea into the right and left main bronchus. And I think this is what we're seeing here. And then usually we want to see this NG tube continue down the central line, bypass that bifurcation, that carina, continue, 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 down the middle of the diaphragm and into ideally um, the stomach bubble or gastric bubble there. Obviously this doesn't do that. Um, so yeah, we need to be asking questions and you've correctly identified we've got a, a, an NG tube in the right main bronchus. So this patient doesn't necessarily have an aspiration at the moment, although they may well have one from previously with their swallowing difficulties, but if we were to feed into that, we would cause major problems. Well done. Um, yeah, this is just to outline how it should look, as I described, goes down the midline, bifurcates the carina, which I think is roughly here, um, continues down the midline again through the diaphragm um, and is sitting in the stomach. So what's important as well is that you have enough NG tube in the stomach. So if the tip was just about here, yes, it probably is in the stomach. Um, but it's slightly variable where that gastroesophageal junction is. So if you start feeding into someone's distal esophagus, you can also put them at risk of aspiration. So we really want to see the end of the NG tube at least 10 centimetres past the, um, the, uh, the gastroesophageal yeah, junction. junction, which we can't see obviously on a chest x-ray, so we just measure it by uh, the middle of the diaphragms there. Okay. Great. Right. Well, maybe make this the last case just for time's sake, yeah. Because uh, Samuel has to catch a train. <laughs> um, so this is a seventy-six-year-old female who is short of breath on exertion. Uh, left pleural effusion. Uh, straight out of the bat, yeah. Well done. Um, Great. Yeah. That's... Why is it a left pleural effusion? What about it makes yeah. you think that? Um, the, the diaphragm is way above the right side, and the costophrenic angle is non-existent. Yeah. area that's supposed to be the lungs kind of all filled with white fluid. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's absolutely right. So what we're seeing here um, isn't a raised diaphragm, although it does look like that, but what we're seeing here is the meniscus of the fluid. Okay, so you're think, absolutely right. Think back to your chemistry days where it's sort of when you filled up a cylinder and when that dip came through, that's basically what you're seeing just with that fluid level. Yeah, so we um, we have a very dense opacification of, of the left hemithorax below this curved meniscus. Um, and this is just a classic appearance of a large pleural effusion. You're absolutely right. Um, and because this is full of fluid, it has a mass effect as well on everything else both in that side of the chest, but also in the other side of the chest. So did anyone notice something a bit weird about the mediastinum, maybe on the right side or the trachea? Does that look totally normal or is it maybe a bit different? Is there tracheal deviation? Yeah, there's probably an element of that because it's so much just now on the left that sort of has nowhere really to go. So it'll start pushing across to the right and what does it? it just pushes the structures across to the right. So yes, this probably is significant left pleural effusion with some tracheal deviation or midline shift to the right. So yeah, absolutely. It's, it's quite helpful shift. to think when there's been shift from the midline, um, is something pulling it towards itself or is something pushing it away? And a useful way to categorize that is 
where there is pathology, is that pathology causing a loss of volume where it is or an increase in volume where it is? And obviously, if you pour a load of fluid into something, you're going to increase the volume in that space. And therefore, this pleural occlusion is pushing away the mediastinal structures. So you're absolutely right. There is tracheal de deviation associated. We have one helpful slide about it, and then we'll maybe take some questions. But just remember about pleural effusions that obviously it depends on whether the patient is standing up or sitting down. We actually have stolen this um, slide from Ambry, one of our colleagues. Um, it's very helpful. Because um, obviously, fluid will sort of go where gravity goes. So looking at these different um, bottles here, you can imagine that if this patient was actually lying down, you wouldn't necessarily see that meniscus here, but you might actually see that the whole left lung looks a bit whiter than it should do or more opaque than it should do, or there is um, yeah, less obvious um, lucency or in the lung because actually the fluid has sort of settled all completely down the back of it. Um, so it's just a helpful way to think about, um, I think we've maybe got a picture of that as well, demonstrating. So we're seeing here this right pleural effusion with the meniscus here um, and how that might look quite different. Obviously, this is maybe a different patient, but how that might look, look quite different when this patient is supine, as we're seeing in this film, actually now it's spread throughout the entire lung. And that's just not necessarily that the pathology has changed. It's not now that there might not even be that the effusion is any worse. Um, but it's actually just distributed along the back, just like we're looking at in these bottles. That makes sense to everyone? So someone's put, Alfie, I think, has probably put in a little feedback forms. Yeah, so we've got we'll, we will dive to the end. Um, so thank you so much for listening to our ramblings. Um, yeah, it's been a pleasure to do this session and thank you as well for piping up and talking to us. Really appreciated. Yeah, so what this QR code is, it's a little link to a feedback form. We would greatly value your feedback just so that if we find ourselves in a similar situation, we can maybe do it better next time. Yeah, please. Um, and likewise, if you do have any questions um, that you maybe think of in the future or haven't been addressed by what we have said, you are very welcome to email us. Um, yeah, we'd be happy to chat to you about anything radiology, radi yeah, radiology related or otherwise, yeah. um, particularly if you're interested in doing radiology yourselves. Um, we've had quite recent experience with the application process, so we'd be very happy to chat to you about that. Um, but for now... I think Declan had some questions. Yeah. If anyone else has any questions, feel free to say or 